back to Torah for the Nations Weekly. Now, normally we're live from Spot Israel with Peshek Sherbo, but Peshek is a little under the weather today, uh, but thank heaven it's not coronavirus, and we're praying that he, uh, he has a quick and speedy recovery, but he's got his loyal co-host, Terry Hayes and Scotty Helton in Tennessee, ready to host a broadcast, plus he's joined in the Zoom room by many people from all around the planet. Hey, I see we got Daniel just joined in from Bogota, Colombia, South America, and my friend Veronica Porch here, so I'm excited. Let's jump right in and say hi to Terry Hayes and let him start with his class. Terry, how are you doing tonight? You got the microphone, sir, you're on the air. Doing good. Thank you, Dan, for everything you do for for us and Pesach and Shira. Just want to welcome everyone to uh, the Tour for the Nations class tonight. And tonight, I want to dedicate our class to our rabbi, Rabbi Pesach Sherbo, that he may uh, be strengthened and uh, have a complete and full recovery and get his strength back. He has been under the weather with a, a virus of some sort. Uh, flu or virus but it is not COVID he's been tested and he, he is not that but he's uh, just still needs our prayers he needs rest and so I want to dedicate our our class tonight in his honor uh, because to be honest with you without him none of us would probably be here <laughs> so so tonight I'm going to attempt I have a lot of stuff in my head <laughs> as most people know. But tonight, if anyone's seen the announcement, what I want to do is kind of cover a little bit about the flood, Nineveh, and Hamas, because they both have, the flood and Nineveh both have Hamas in, in common. We're going to look at, look at this. And I've got several commentaries that I want to go through. Um, I've got my, my, Rabbi Hirsch commentary. They've all got some similar information, but each has some different things that they bring out that's really interesting. I'm going to open up with the, I don't know if many of you are familiar with the Ramban, Rabbi, McNa uh, Rabbi Moshe Nachmanides. Get it tongue-tied there, because so, we always talk about the Ramban, <laughs> the Mana, and so it's easy to get that tongue-tied to get them back to, you know back and forth which one but i really like the ramban there's several different things i've studied from him throughout the years that i really like his his teaching on and tonight the text i was wanting to cover is uh, genesis chapter 6 verses 11 through 13 that what we're going to be touching on and Sometimes, I mean, we know this, we, we read a little bit of this. We know that, you know, the flood happened. We, we kind of know, and the rabbis tell us this didn't happen arbitrarily. But um, we, I feel as, as Noahides, we really need to, to, to grasp what happened with the flood. What does the rainbow covenant uh, or the covenant of the rainbow uh, mean? And I want to bring a little bit of that up in, in the end, Hashem willing. But there's so much dealing with the flood that it still affects us. It affects mankind all the time because we can tell even always as far as Nineveh, it, it happened, to, you know, within that city. But um, one of the things I just feel like, and don't take this wrong, but it's just my perception Sometimes I feel like some of these things is not taking the, is, is the, the issue of the Sheva mitzvahs is not as taken as serious. And I've been learning some more stuff. I can't go in tonight that I hope to do another teaching or maybe a writing on that. I'm learning from Rabbi Hirsch that opens up Hashem's, the knowledge of Hashem even more. That this is not a religion, never was, never will be. It is, it is divine. It's divine. It's a divine plan for the creation from the Creator. And and the more I get into Genesis, I, I messaged Scotty the other day. I said, I don't know when I'll ever get out of Genesis because I just keep learning 
every, like every week I learned something else. And, and I'm like, I, I get, I got to dig into that. You know, I, that's not my personality. I love to, to dig into this stuff and, and, and learn. This is the depth to, you know, other people like Kabbalah and Zohar. I love Genesis. <laughs> I love the Hebrew of Genesis. And it's just so much. It's, it's life giving. It's just life giving. Back when I was still in my old faith, I'd started something nudged me to start studying the, the conversation God had with Cain. That went on for about two years. And one day I was leaving uh, for work and I told my wife, I said, I don't understand what I'm about to say, but the meaning of life is in the book of Genesis and I've got to find it. And I've been finding it. It's amazing of the meaning of life that's in the book of Genesis. It's changed my life. It's probably changed my life as much as the day that I rejected the worship of something else and came to the one true God of Israel. That's, that's how, how important Genesis is to me. It's as much as important to me as that decision I made that day. So before uh, I keep rambling on here, <laughs> Scotty, anything before I get started? No, no, Terry, I'm, I'm looking forward to what you've, you're going to present to us tonight because you've shown me bits and pieces and thank you for helping me stay up on that reading as you've shown it to me. Now, any, anybody watching tonight, if they end up in the same place, the only thing I can tell you to do is get up and go ahead and read and study and then you'll be able to sleep after you get all that inside. And, and Terry, can we uh, dedicate tonight's um, uh, uh, meeting forward slash class to Rabbi Pesach for yeah, his yeah, yeah. discovery. You I, did that, didn't you? I, did. I was posting things on Facebook while you was doing that. So sorry I didn't catch that. So. That's not, not a problem. Yeah, I, I just wanted to make sure we dedicate the, this Torah lesson, for, you know, on behalf of our rabbi. He got a double portion tonight, then, didn't he? He got a double portion. There we go. You know, for long, he'll be up, and, you know, and dancing with the Torah, even though it's not Simcha Torah. <laughs> Uh, so, anyhow, Genesis chapter 6, verse 11, and I'm going to be reading from the Art Scroll uh, Ramban. Um, then I'm also going to be reading from, from the Hirsch as well. It says, Now the earth had become corrupt before God, and the earth had become filled with injustice. And God saw that the earth uh, and God saw the earth, and behold, it was corrupted, and for all flesh had corrupted its way upon the earth. Now God said to Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with injustice through them. And behold, I am about to destroy them from the earth. I never knew that said a whole, a whole lot of stuff. There is a lot of information right here that, that, that I went through. In the Ramban, this was really cool, what, I, what I'd read the other night. In chapter 13, it says, God said to Noah, the end of all flesh has come before me where the earth is filled with injustice through them. In verse, back up in verse 11, it says, Now the earth had become corrupt before God, and it, and it had become filled with injustice. And so, uh, hello, Ezekiel. We're in Genesis chapter 6, verse 11 through 13, if you, you want to know, um, or if you want to follow along. Um, what is interesting here? is in 13, God gave Noah, and I'm reading from, from the Ramban, God gave Noah the reason for the destruction of the earth. In, in, in verse 13, it was injustice. In, in verse 11, there are two sins, but he only mentioned the one to Noah. Now, 
where it says now the earth wa- had be- had become corrupt. I'm not going to dare try to pronounce the Hebrew word for corrupt right now. I'm not as fluent as I used to be in my, I can read it myself, but enunciating it's another story. But the word corrupt here, when we read that the earth has come corrupt, and when you read about corruption within the Hebrew scriptures, it is referring to sexual immorality. When we see the Ramban uses the word that the earth was filled with injustice, that is the word Hamas, which a lot of times is translated robbery or violence, but it's even more than that. And and Rabbi Hirsch even shares a little bit more in depth about Hamas, the word. But when he taught, when God talked to Noah, he didn't mention the, the sexual immorality. He just mentioned that it was full of injustice. And he says, I'm just going to read this again. God gave Noah the reason for the destruction of the earth as injustice. He did not mention the other sin corrupting the ways, which means the uh, the sexual sins. It says, because injustice, this is very interesting. This is something for us. Injustice is known as a public sin, whereas sexual immorality, for the most part, is private. Does anyone get what that is saying? That when God with Noah was looking at the two, the sin that was public, man against man, was going to be dealt a heavier blow. That's not saying that the sexual sins were any less, but we're talking about when he decides to get involved with man, whether it be the flood, whether it be Nineveh, whether it be Sodom and Gomorrah, every time it was the public sin that is highlighted. The Scotty, what do you think? Anybody else? Thinking about that, uh, now, when you say public, if I can just ask, does that, that mean how they treated each other? That's how they treated each other. Robbery. It was public. That, that's, go ahead. I, if I get talking on that, I'll be, go ahead. <laughs> oh, no. Everybody's ever known me, you know, i got to have my books. <laughs> in the uh, Art Scroll interlinear Hamish uh, of Genesis, uh, it brings out the point. It says, such is the progression of sin. It begins in private. That's why corruption is mentioned first. The earth was corrupt. He brought out the issue of the private sin first. When people still have a sense of right and wrong, but once people develop the habit of sinning, they gradually lose their shame and immoral behavior behavior becomes accepted and even a required norm. The Midrash teaches that they stole from one another in petty ways. See, they've moved from privacy to public, to the public sin that they stole in petty ways that were not subject to the authority of the courts. Though this is not the gravest kind of sin, it is morally damaging to the extreme because thievery within the letter of the law weakens the conscience and corrupts social fabric. So, t- Terry, if I can ask, so that means they learned the system and how to manipulate the system, and they didn't have any morals, they didn't have any remorse about it. Is no, that what you're saying? He, I'm going to bring out some interesting something that, that, that deals with that, with what Rabbi Hirsch says here in just a second. Uh, 
it says the sage on in, in article goes on and shows and set and the sages Sanhedrin 108a however said that the reason only injustice is mentioned here is that it was specifically over injustice that their decree was sealed not over the sexual immorality the sin of that generation was sealed because of their injustice it was great it, had, it started out see it was it's private it's and then it moves to the public it pick, it picked up steam pretty much and it became it actually became greater and i mean let me get to rabbi hirsch now some, mention something else um but he goes on and say, he says, uh, uh, the Ramban goes on and says that the reason why this sin sealed their fate over the others is because it is a law that is intuitively understood by the people and had no need for a prophet to warn them about, unlike the sin of immorality, the people could conceivably rationalize. Furthermore, injustice is an evil both toward God and toward man, while sexual immorality does not necessarily involve harming another person. It's generally between two people on the general basis. But the sin of injustice impacts the society. And I thought that was, that was very interesting. Any comments, any thoughts on, on that? Dan, if I weigh in, Terry? Go ahead, Dan. I've seen you want to come in there bad. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I enjoy where you're going with this. Uh, from what I've all, all studied and read is that it's, it was that injustice was robbery. It was a degree of pecuniary is what the word they used. Uh, had to do with a monetary uh, uh, bent. And from my, my studies, the, the best I can, I can tell is pre-flood, okay, was really the dawn of a currency system, okay, period, all right? Post-flood, it becomes even clearer a currency system. Pre-flood, it, it just started, and it started in a very uh, basic and primitive way. They would sell cattle between each other, one to another, okay, or property of one sort. And what they would do is use a simple clay box, okay, and they would seal the box, but they had little tokens that they put in, simple clay tokens that they put in, and they were shaped specifically, okay, like a little circle, a little cone, a little square. These meant things, right? The little square might have meant a bull, or a cone might have meant a bull, and uh, vice versa. The point is, they would seal it in a box, right, in a clay box with clay, and that would be your ownership papers. You know how today in our day and age you have so many legalese for property, right? You got, you got uh, you know, a certificate of ownership for your car and things of this nature. Uh, but this was the way mankind started to work. Well, people started to cheat, right? They started to cheat. They started to break these things open, remake another one, seal it back up and change the number that was in there if they could uh, and argue over little things. Plus, I've heard from a lot of rabbis is that the uh, theft of gleaning, you know, uh, which they permit in the land of Israel around the, the borders of, say, a farm, like if, if a person was hungry or begging, they could pick the wheat around a certain area at the edge of a farm or, or the fruit. Um, but the point being is that, yeah, it, it was flat out robbery, but it was a dawn of, of, of a monetary system. And if you just track it historically, it starts to bring alive a lot of uh, uh, things. And eventually, this system, eventually the system became a, a writing system. They got to the point post-flood where they started to uh, make these shapes more complex. They started to put markings on them. So now a round dot meant four sheep if you had a cross on it, right? All of a sudden they realized, hey, why don't we just mark it on a clay tablet, right? And they started to use uh, earliest forms of, 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 of penmanship, but the Hebrew Hebrew writing does trace all the way back uh, to the earliest stages of the formation of what became, you know, photo, what they call, uh, uh, yeah, the, the way early hieroglyphics were, were uh, written in such a style, and same with the cuneiform, it had representative uh, uh, 
pictograms that, 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 that showed. Very interesting study though, uh, but it was linked to a monetary system and that's where the robbery came in. I hope that helps a little bit or give you some idea. Right. Yeah, and then just, well, I've got an example. I'll share that just a little bit, a little bit later. In Rabbi Hirsch's commentary, he, in verse 11, it says, and the earth was corrupt before God's countenance, and so the earth was filled with wrongdoing. And he, he too, like the sages, teaches that the word corrupt means sexual immorality, that the earth was uh, uh, corrupt with the sexual immorality before God's countenance. And so the earth was filled with wrongdoing. And he translates Hamas instead of injustice or, or um, robbery as wrongdoing. And it's really interesting in, in how he, he, show, he, he plays this out and shows the wrongdoing of that Hamas is wrongdoing. Before we, he gets into the word um, Hamas a little bit, he, he brings out a passage in Job 15.33 about a vine shedding its grapes before they're ripe. He says, Rabbi Hirsch says, if a vine sheds unripe grapes, it commits Hamas against the fruit. The Hamas is not committed all at once. Rather, the fruit draws of sustenance from the vine, uh, yeah, from the vine is slowly stopped until the fruit drops off. Then he also says Hamas is related to vinegar. He makes the comment, wine does not sour all at once, but gradually turns to vinegar. And I've read some commentary on this, on, on Job, on the, the passage in Job, was saying that, you know, the vine that uh, sheds unripe grapes mean that the vine, the vine begins to rob the fruit of its nourishment by stopping it. And therefore, it causes the, the, the fruit of the vine to die and to fall off. And, and, and when you're reading what the rabbis teach us and the sages teach us, Hamas, the robbery, brings death. And it's a slow process. Now, we can learn from this all the way back to Adam and Eve, the two trees, that um, Hashem establishes personal property boundaries. These are your trees. These are mine. Eat all you want of yours. Leave mine alone. From the day you do, you'll die. Then what we, we see is the woman going and she's looking at property and desiring property that's not hers. She's coveting. She's coveting her neighbor's property per se. Someone else's, what's not hers. She covets enough and it says she took. She took it. She went ahead and she robbed. She stole that which was not hers. And we learn, Hashem says, the day you, you know, when, when they ate it, they, in a way, they consummated the theft. And that brought forth, you know, when Hashem said, for in the day you do, you will, you will die. And what happened was because of theft, they were like fruit dropped from a vine. Theft stopped the blessing of nourishment. Theft is, in my opinion, and through my studies and my own thoughts and meditations upon what I've studied, is a very primary issue with man, and it involves every one of the Sheva mitzvahs. How does theft 
involve all of the mitzvahs? Idolatry. You're robbing God from worship as the creator and king. Blasphemy. You're robbing God of his honor. Sexual immorality. You're robbing yourself and another person of the, of the blessing of a proper sexual relationship that God created. Of course, theft, murder. You're stealing a life. Part of, of theft in the repentance of theft is the, the law of return. If all possible, you're to return what you've stolen. You can't return a life. You cannot return everything to a person that murder does. It's the ultimate theft. It cannot be returned. You can't return a, a lost father, a lost brother. You can't return children that may never be born, grandchildren, and generation. you've stolen generation upon generation. So murder is the ultimate theft because you can't return that life. Only the one who gives it can return it. And so, and then, of course, we have the laws of justice that, you know, we're supposed to set up courts. Well, the, one of the biggest issues we deal with is, is theft, really. Everything boils down to theft. Then you have the law of uh, Evermen High, the you shall not eat the, li um, the limb of a living animal. If you do, you're, you're stealing life from that animal. It's suffering. So in essence, theft goes from the garden. It goes through every one of our commandments. It touches every one of them. And yet this was theft and was the issue of the flood. It's, it's, the, it's the, the main ingredient of Hamas. And so when you look at the wine, does not sour all at once. It's, it's gradually. You begin, like the passage here in 11, it begins with sexual morality, but it ends with injustice, wrongdoing, robbery. It starts out small, starts out slow. You can't see the damage, the end. You can't see the end damage. But in chapter, in verse 11, I mean, the earth was corrupt before God's countenance, and so the earth was filled with wrongdoing. You, 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 you start with corruption and end with Hamas. Then it's all theft. Every bit of it's theft. An example of my own life. I taught a little bit about, just write, did a little write-up on this issue with Adam and Eve in, a, in something that uh, Scotty and I are doing where we're, we're teaching some pastors some things. And they actually went to their church that week and taught what, what I wrote on. And, 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 and Scotty can share a little bit more about that. But I, I showed in there that one of the issues was what Eve did. So she shared with her husband and he did eat. One, she shared a stolen item. The husband took a stolen item and made personal use for, from it. He, he, he took and made personal gain from a stolen item, item when he ate. So he took, he took part in the theft. And so I talked I talk a little bit on this here a couple of weeks ago. Well, when about, about a week or so, it's like Hashem says, okay, you know, you taught it and I'm going to test you. Got a guy at work. We was talking about movies one day. And there's a movie that was out that I was wanting to see. It's based on some true events in World War II. And, but I stream. I don't, I don't have everything. I just have certain channels. And I'm like, and this particular movie came out on a channel that I don't have. And it came, I'm not paying. You didn't want to pay for another channel. So he loves going, my friend the, or my coworker loves going to a flea market down in North Georgia, and there, there's this guy who records a bunch of movies on CDs and sells them for two or three bucks, technically violating copyright laws, and I knew that, 
of course, my coworker is very simple minded. I don't mean that derogatory. I, I can't explain some things to him because it's just, it's just not where Hashem has his mind. Like what I'm talking with you here tonight, he couldn't, he wouldn't be able to grasp it. So he brought me, he bought one of those discs because he had it and he, he brought it. He said, oh man, here, here, watch this. It's good. And I knew I was going to, in a few days, he's going to ask, oh, did you watch it? And want to talk about the movie. But I'm like, if I do that, I'm sharing in the guy's theft who recorded it illegally. So I got on, 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 uh, uh, online and started finding out what I could do to, to rent. I was willing to rent. I paid $15, $20 to rent the movie and, and not put that DVD in my computer and, and, and watched it for free. But I found out that there was a, I could get the app for my TV, that particular station. They had a seven day free trial. Okay, this is offered, this is legal. I got on there and I, actually I was thinking about keeping the app and then I got to looking around at that and I'm like, ah, I probably won't use this, you know, maybe once or twice. It's not gonna be worth the money to buy this extra channel. But it's a seven day free trial. I watched the movie, went back to work, handed him this great movie. Talked about it. But do you see how easy it could be? What's in the harm? Somebody bought a movie, you know, DVD for three bucks that was bootlegged. But it's no different than Adam partaking in the fruit that was given to him that was stolen. This is the depth. You know, we talk about the depth of, of our commandments. There's so much depth to our commandments that I don't think we'll ever understand the depth of everything, especially like theft. Theft is a friend of mine, uh, Abby, that lives in Minnesota, her husband, uh, Jacob and him uh, run the um, uh, Norhide Online Gathering. She, she studies theft. She's one of the most brilliant people I know. I, there's times I send her questions because she has studied it out. So that's her thing is to study the, the subject, the, the prohibition of theft. But there's so many times we, we have run into these situations in our daily life. We've got to come to the point that this is what Hashem wants us to do. It's more important to question our actions according to our seven laws. I'm probably going to get myself in trouble here, but then to run after these permissible things because we are judged, our righteousness is based on the seven laws and their, and their details, and so is our judgment. We might do all these permitted things just perfect, but if we've not spent our time pondering and meditating and studying, just like Psalms 1 says that, you know, his desire was the Torah and he meditated upon it day and night. Some sages equate, there's even a midrash about that Psalm was referring to Noah that he meditated upon the seven laws so much that he was able to derive the whole Torah. Now that's a midrash. And so can you imagine if you just took, you spend the time in the seven laws and ponder and meditate and our actions, our little actions like that, watching this, a DVD player, you know, or a DVD, I mean, just loan to you. But, but it was stolen in the, you know, down the line, it was stolen. And so this is where the, the wine begins to, to turn the vinegar real slow and the vine begins to choke off the grapes. And Robert Hirsch goes on and says, now the verse says, and the earth was corrupt before the countenance of God. And so the earth was filled with wrongdoing. First comes the moral corruption, sin, which civic society, civic, yeah, civic society is not concerned. People think that even in the young and the, and the dissolute and the married life has become deteriorated. Trade and commerce can still flourish and business and relationships can proceed honestly. But once the world is corrupt before God himself, 
all the laws and institutions of society will not be able to save a society from ruin. Mm. And how much in our nations and in many other nations that we have made laws so that certain immoralities can be legal. Wow. Can I ask a question, Terry? Go ahead. Um, you know, this was new to me uh, in the last year or so. Um, the, the Hebrew, um, the Hebrew uh, understanding of the word hefker, okay, which they have derived to deal with such. But I thought, you know, the more I studied it, I thought it could be a slippery slope. Exactly what, like you're talking, the, you know, hefker is, is something that they generally think of as an ownerless property. Like if you're walking down the street and you find a $20 bill on the ground, right? It's just blowing in the wind, right? And you, you stop it and you grab it and you catch it and you look around and there's nobody you can attribute it to. You can't say, hey, did you drop something? you know, to anybody. It's just blowing in the wind. Well, that's considered ownerless property. You have full and clear right to spend that money, and it's not theft in any way, shape, or form. Right. But we're dealing with this digital age, just like you're talking about, like a pirated movie uh, and things of that nature, and it starts to get very sketchy, very, very, very sketchy easily. Now, uh, one of the rabbis had told me that it's, it's considered, uh, you know, the biggest problem in the, in the world as far as pirating, you know, is between, you know, China and, and Israel. And this was told to me by a popular rabbi. And the point being, you know, the term Hefker, in their eyes, a lot of Hebrew people think, well, nobody owns it. You know, and I actually called in to check a, a, a rabbi's ministry, a rabbi's outreach, a popular rabbi, because I watched, you know, and you mentioned copyright. I've worked with CG animation and, 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 you know, making films and stuff for years. And I know how tight and what's permissible and what's not. And I saw this, 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 this rabbi's outreach endlessly use popular uh, clips from, you know, like Marvel comic movies uh, and high end Disney studio, Hollywood movies, as if they were free to just cut and paste into your own, do you know your own deal your own movie and put together your message and you know though he may have a good honorable intent in the message delivering it in that punchy fashion where they've got 300 animators working for you know high high paying wages to produce it and you just find a clip of it on the internet well i argued with some of these jewish folks over this i says i said you know and they said well it's hefker it's online once it hits social media it's hefker and I'm like, excuse me, like this is public knowledge that it's that's from this movie and that's from this movie and that's from that movie. Well, they don't watch the movies, so, you know, in reality, they don't pay attention to it. Well, it's on social media, so it became a big topic of debate. Yet I know the high moral character and integrity of the rabbis, you know, when they have a ruling, a, a bet din hefker, something that a rabbinical court has actually ruled on. There's areas that seem gray, especially in this digital age, and you do have a lot of these uh, people that will just, hey, I, I can grab this file, I can grab that file. We see on social media, especially us B'nai Noach that are reaching out, we know that people search for free information. Free information, I just want free information. But the reality is that doesn't help anybody. I mean, things don't grow, they don't survive, you know, they don't, they, you know, you can't have somebody teach 24 seven for free. You know, they, they've got to yeah. they've got to keep, you know, the roof over their heads and a livelihood. I mean, you know, I'm all for supporting, you know, Peshek tries to do what he does to reach out. You know, people should support stuff like that. Uh, you know, you're working. You know, I, I jumped in to take a job when when uh, when uh, COVID hit because I, I saw the need in my community and I thought I can help. And, you know, but but Hashem provides and we know this. But when people will write it off so simple as saying, well, it's ownerless especially with the digital material. Um, if I can find it, I can, I can own it and I can manipulate it. Software is a weird thing. Software is a weird thing because it's really a tool. And the question of using a tool, if you found a screwdriver or a power drill or a, a high-end press or something, you know somebody technically owned it. But when you find a piece of software that you could rework, 
is, is, have you stolen it? You know, is there a free version? Well, what's the, you know, and so it opens just a huge can of worms. But the question of Hefker, are you familiar with, with some of the background on what, you know, you know, because I know the high standard of morality wouldn't call anything Hefker as much. They would go out of their way to try to return to somebody something that was found. But there are real genuine instances, and this is why the rabbis have ruled that something can be Hefker, ownerless property. But when somebody's actually snipping out ownerless property like a, like a ferret, or, 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 or all they do all day long is surf looking for freebies, um, there's that heart of theft I think you touched on, but if you could elaborate, I mean, because I know you're going down the path of, you know, how bad it is. And I just see that in the wrong hands, the concept of Hefker could be seen as something that, you know, gives them a green light to take advantage of things. And I wouldn't want to ever see that happen because it leads to what you're talking about. Right. This is why we, we've got to take serious the instructions of Hashem. We really, we really do. We've got to take, take serious these issues. Um, this is more important than rituals and, and sacred times. This stuff was the foundation and it's the foundation of Israel too. Now I've not heard of the word that Dan has said before. I know what he's saying now. I've never heard it, but I understand it because my first rabbi taught me that we, if we find money, you know, and we can't return it because, you know, it's, you know, like he said, it's kind of public domain now. It's out there. Nobody knows who owns it. It's ownerless. My rabbi told me, he says, Hashem never, never blesses you through someone else's loss. And so, therefore, Anything, my wife and I, we, we, this is what we practice. When we find money, and my wife's good at finding the paper kind, mine is the run over one that you can't tell what it is kind. And, um, but we donate it to charity. That's what my, my first rabbi taught me. He says, if you find something, even a penny, I, when I pick up a penny today, I say tzedakah. I just say it outside of myself. It's Sadaka. It's not mine. It might be ownerless, but it's not mine. Because Hashem doesn't bless me through someone else's loss. And therefore, I donate Sadaka and let Hashem take that. Like Scotty's talked about charity. Take that and, that and uplift it by giving it back to the divine and letting him see, you know, let him put it where it needs to go. And so... But like I said, there's so many things today with the, the technology, but still just like as simple as my first rabbi, it all boils down to the simplicity of the Torah. You know, there, 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 are, there are those who want to argue that light, you know, flipping a light switch is not starting a fire. But a spark is the smallest part of a fire. And that's the reason why they don't flip one on the Sabbath. It's the reason why they don't ride in automobiles because of internal combustion. It's a fire. And they are specifically told in the Torah, you shall not kindle a fire on the Shabbat. And they take that serious. Even to the point they don't flip a light switch. Because, the, you know, the smallest amount of violating, you know, a commandment is violating a commandment. And that's, that's why I'm saying when we look at theft, we really have to look at our lives. What, what are we doing? And it's going to be interesting. You know, I'll bring it out when I get to Jonah here in just a, just a few minutes. But Rabbi Hirsch goes on. He says, the world will never be filled with outright, outright robbery. For society has penal codes, prison terms, which to protect itself from such crimes. But Hamas... And there's an, he, another Hebrew word for, for robbery. It's uh, Gimel Zion Lamed. I'm not sure how to pronounce it. It doesn't have the um, vowel points with it, but there's a word for robbery in the Hebrew. But Hamas, the, the Het Mem Samik, wrongdoing, as Rabbi Hirsch says, facilitated by cunning. Now, where does cunning, where does that remind us of? 
who was cunning in the beginning? The who, serpent. The serpent who missed, misdirected Eve. But wrongdoing facilitated by cunning destroys a society. There is no protection against Hamas if man's conscience does not admonish him before God. That's how I would answer you, Dan, is that, the, that there is no protection of Hamas. The wrongdoing of, of theft or, or whatever, if our conscience doesn't admonish, doesn't rebuke us, doesn't warn us, doesn't caution us, our conscience should, con should, should warn us and caution us before God that what we are about to do isn't right. If you do something like, let's say, oh, well, that's ownerless, but you have that nudge inside of you that there's something else going on, that's your conscience that you need to come before God. And there is no protection against it without a, a, a conscience. Those who lose their conscience are completely overrun by Hamas. There's no protection from it. It says, hey, go ahead. No, I'm sorry. Uh, Thomas had his hand up. Oh, okay. then, then if it's okay after Thomas gets through, is it okay if I tell a little story? Yeah, go ahead. Thomas, go ahead. Um, I was just um, trying to figure something out here. I mean, I'm not the brightest apple in the bushel, and I'm okay with that. But when you're talking about, like, the money, the, your rabbi said uh, that, like, if you find it, and if you can't find out where it goes, but you keep it, it's, it's not yours. You can't uh, gain from someone else's loss. But if you give it to charity, isn't that someone else gaining still from the loss? No, you're, you're, when I have a Sadaka box in, in my house, a charity box, it's like Scotty calls it. When we find something, we put it in there. That belongs to God, not us. And so when we give it to a charity, which we do charity, which through charity, and I hate the word charity, but through Sadaka, we can even have repentance. Repentance mm -hmm. will take care of us. And someone else may be hurting. But we let Hashem deal with that. We've, we've, we've took that which was lost that we couldn't return, and we've given it to him. Said, this is yours. Because it was his to begin with. Hashem owns it all. Okay, and, I, I and, 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 and if, I'll be honest with you. If all possible, if you think about it, we give something to Hashem. He knows who it went to. He could return it. He could cause that person to be the receiver of that if that is his desire. We may, he'll, he'll take it beyond what we can do. But initially, we're taking what was his that he allowed someone else to use, but for some reason it became lost, and we give it back to its owner, who is Hashem. Okay, I got it now. Thank you. By the way, that's the first time I really even thought about it that in those terms. When we can't find the owner, we return it to its owner because he owns it all. And he can direct where it needs to go. That, that, that's a great way to uh, look at that. That's a great way to, to have that in your soul. Uh, right. So can, can I have a couple of minutes? Go ahead. Jerry? Uh, I'll try to do this quick, but as y'all know, um, uh, there's nothing. Uh, I, yeah, I saw, I saw you, Amuela. Thank you so much. When I was a little boy, now, I was, and I'm, I'm going to just give you a paraphrase of towns and terms. If I say anything that uh, you don't understand, just stop me and I'll, I'll try to get Terry to um, um, translate it for you. Uh, but uh, when I was a little boy, I was the, I felt I was the apple of my grandmother's eye. Um, I, my grandparents raised me and, and I'm talking, you know, from a little child, I was, I felt I was the apple of my grandmother's eye. I would do nothing to uh, harm that view that my grandmother had of me being the apple of her eye. Now, I don't know if any of you remember the days we used to have these stores called five and dime. 
Uh, they was just real. And, and the biggest thing they sold was toys for little boys who was the apple of their grandmother's eye. So, but I saw this little toy in there. It was a little toy Derringer gun, just a little cap gun. And I wanted that. And I went and asked my grandmother. I, I, said, uh, I, I called her Mima, And I said, can, Mima, can I have this? And she said, no, I'd rather you not have that today. So on the way putting it back on the shelf, I was devising a plan in my mind how I could slip this in my pocket and walk out the store with it. So I did. I slipped it in my pocket. I walked out the door. Now I had another problem. My next problem is we lived in a fenced in lot. There was no other kids around. How was I going to play with this toy gun that I just slipped in my pocket? So I devised a plan. I, I wrapped the, the, the little gun up in toilet paper and my grandmother was out in the front yard breaking beans. Y'all remember those days? And so I went and sat down beside her and I slipped it out of my pocket on the ground. This little boy who now has stole and has moved it to the next position where I could play with it. And I looked down at it and I said, look, what, what is this? And I opened it up and it was that little toy gun. I said, look, Mimo, somebody walked through our yard and dropped this toy. And my grandmother looked at me with a little tear in her eye and she said, I saw you take that. I was devastated. I was devastated. She made me go back to the store. I, unbeknownst to me at the time, she had told the manager of the store that she would bring me back. She went and told him she saw me steal the gun and she would bring me back. So I had to go back and confess and just, oh, it was just, um, but it made an impression in my mind. There has been times in my life that I found wallets. I remember the, the and, and it's progressed. I'll just tell you two of them. I just want to be real quick. Is it okay, Terry, if I go on and tell you? Two? The first one, it was a rainy morning and I was doing my normalty unlocking gates. Most of you that know me know that I, uh, seven days a week, I'm out early in the morning unlocking gates to businesses and I lock them at night. It'd been raining that morning and I saw in the middle of the highway, a wallet. So I stopped and I picked it up. Now it had a little less than $50 in it. Um, but it had the driver's license and, and all the information for this young man. So I, it was wet. I took the time to get it out and it didn't have his address. So I made some phone calls. I, I looked up in the phone book and, and so people was calling me back think that was just so admirable you doing that. And, and so I finally found the boy and I took it to his house and, and when, when the boy's father come to the door, he thought it was the strangest thing. I said, here, I found, I think it's your son's wallet. And, and I said, it's, it's got some money in it. And he looked at me like I was crazy because the money was still there. It was a common, he knew it was a common thing that if anybody found a wallet with money in it, if that wallet was returned, that money was not going to be there. But I made an impression on them. Lo and behold, I didn't realize, but the, the daughter worked at one of the businesses that I eat at. And she said, wow, I've always heard him talk about it, but I've never seen it in action. So I got one more. Just before I went on vacation this year, I, sure enough, I found another wallet in the road. Had quite a bit of money in it. A, a few hundred dollars, quite a bit of money in it. Had the young man's um, name, an address. So I started driving, trying to find this address. I put it in my GPS. I called my employer. I said, I'm going to be late. I found this wallet in the road and it's got a lot of money in it. And I just, I don't want to take a chance. I'm going to go find him. While I was driving there, something inside me said, you know, you're fixing to go on vacation. That money would really make your vacation great. And Terry, I want to tell you what I started doing. I started laughing because I want to be, I hope this doesn't sound bad. I want to be the apple 
of Hashem's eyes. I want to do the right thing. And so as I was driving to find that young man, I was laughing, Terry, because I was able to not put that money in my I was I desired to give it back to a tribal owner. When I pulled up in the front yard, there were several people in the front yard. A young man come out, and um, I said, did you, I asked for the name, and he said, that's me. And I said, did you lose anything? And uh, he said, I lost my wallet. And now he lost it three days ago. Wow. It laid in that road for three days waiting on me to see it. Everybody else it was blind to. And come to find out the rent money was in there. He had just gotten paid and left the bank that was right down the road from there. When I left there, Terry, I got in the car. I started bawling like a baby because I, I knew inside. Can I say that I passed the test? Can I say it like that? I passed right. I passed the test. There's nothing wrong with saying you passed the test when you passed the test. So go ahead, Terry. I just wanted to tell all that. Just go ahead. This all pictures, and I don't know how many here read my last blog, Adorned uh, in Mitzvah. A um, friend of mine who's of the, the tribe of Levy sent me a picture of him himself performing one of the, you know, the – Mitzvah's a Sukkot. He shares stuff with me all the time. And when I saw it, it's beautiful. And it's so easy. I mean, there's so many, especially once they leave other religions, they look at the Jewish people and their performance of the mitzvahs becomes a, a trapping. They see the, the outward beauty of a tallit and the, the esrog and, and the lulav and the seed seats and the the um to feeling and, and they see all this outward stuff but what they don't see is the adornment of the mitzvah when my friend was standing there he was standing before hashem adorned clothed in the mitzvah that he was instructed to do and the that it was the beauty not the outward garment not the outward elements in his hands but the beauty was in the adornment of the mitzvah doing the mitzvah and and that's what hit me that's us when we do what scotty just talked about when you you see that wallet and you find its owner when you know when it's when it's available to be able to do that what caused him to, to weep was he was adorned in the mitzvah And that's what we as Noahides need to become adorned, clothed in the Sheva Mitzvahs B'nai Noach. First and primary, before anything else. So many go, well, I know one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And they think they know it. They, they looked at the garment on the shelf, but they've not put it on yet. We've got to put on the garment of the Sheva Mitzvahs. And when we do, we will stand as beautiful as my Jewish friend was at Sukkot. We will stand just as beautiful before our Creator because we are adorned in our garment that we were given. And that's one of the things I'm learning from Rabbi Hirsch. I'm just going to just say this little bit. We are assigned. We use the word duty all the time, but I don't think we get it. When I was reading from Rabbi Hurst, we are assigned. The Jews are assigned a specific mission. We are assigned a specific mission as the non-Jew. Our clothing is Sheva Mitzvahs. Our assignment is Sheva Mitzvahs. Yes, there are things permissible, but they're not our assignment. We've got to, to not just one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Yeah, I know it. That's just, that's just you know, taking a, a hanger off the, the rack at JCPenney's and looking at it without putting it on. We've got to put on the Sheva Mitzvahs. We've got to become adorned in these things. 
and clothed before, before the creator, the king. The king has assigned us these things. We need to learn to take that seriously. We need to ponder on what does it mean to be assigned something to do by the creator. And there's so many, it's, it's revealed right there in Genesis chapter one. Ooh, just, yeah, I get eat up with Genesis. <laughs> Terry, Terry's about to get excited on here now. Look out. I, I, Terry, can I throw something else in what you're talking about? Go ahead. I, I, I never. Take a drink. <laughs> I, I've, I've saw the depth in this, but I, I never realized the, the mindset of it. Now, uh, Thomas brought up about, and Dan brought up about money's fount. And uh, you said, you know, you move that into the Sadaka box. And uh, I, that's what I do a lot of times. I'll, we'll find change and we'll move that into the Sadaka box. Um, that concept of maybe you're under a test. And, you know, that money was dropped from somebody that was supposed to have given that. I'm just giving a hypothetical question, a hypothetical situation that was supposed to have given that to Sadaka and they didn't and they lost that money and you found it to put it in its proper place. It, is, is, that reason, is that rational to think that way? Yes. Yes. But that's tikkun, isn't it? Yes. Preparing the world. Yes. I think that's awesome that Hashem would trust us enough to put us in a situation so we can fulfill his need. Yeah. Go ahead, Terry. I'm through. Just... Anyhow, point is we are given an assignment by the king. These other things that everybody wants to ask questions about is not our assignment. We need to be asking questions about our assignment. That's me. That's what's on in, in my heart. In verse 13 of Genesis chapter 6, it says, And God said to Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me. The earth is filled with wrongdoing. He brought, like, like the Ramban brought up, he, there was two issues in verse 11. He hones it down to one issue that he's going to be involved with when he speaks to Noah. He says, The end of all flesh has come before me. And it's interesting, you know, just off the top of my head, reading it in the past is, okay, because of all this, something's just going to, I've got to take care of this. You know, God's saying, I've got to take care of this. But it says, Rabbi Hart says, the end of all flesh come, uh, come before me could mean the moral condition of, of all flesh has reached such a state that I'm forced to put an end to them. That is the general census of what is, you know, you talk to anybody on the street that's read this passage that it's God is being forced to, to step in. But he says a more likely interpretation. I love this. It really got my mind to, to, to go on. A more likely interpretation, however, would be if I do not intervene, the end will come of its own accord. Say say that one more time, Terry, because I think he says needs to catch you that. It says, if I do not, the a more likely inter interpretation is if I do not intervene, the end will come of its own accord. Um I'm trying to see there's a specific thing that's okay, it's up here at the end. I can that ties that's the end of the explanation of this. Um, he goes on and says, says accordingly we should in, in, interpret the end of all flesh come before me if the present state of affairs continues mankind has no future out of fear of them the earth is already full of Hamas it is concealing from man its bounty just like I said the, 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 the vine conceals, hides the nourishment, and the grapes begin to die and fall off. 
And he says, it is concealing from man its bounty, lest it be used to support, talking about the bounty, the blessing of man, to be used to support sexual immorality, robbery, and murder. And that's what he classifies what wrongdoing is, what Hamas is, is all three. Sexual immorality, robbery, and murder. He goes on and he says, God says to Noah, in view of the circumstances, this is, a, 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 I guess, a, a paraphrasing. God says to Noah, in the view of the circumstances, I am about to destroy them, man. Destruction is the need of the hour, not annihilation, but destruction for the sake of salvation. Man was about to be annihilated by his own works, his own thievery, his own wrongdoing was about to annihilate himself. Therefore, Rabbi Hirsch is saying a better way to understand that at the end of flesh has come before me, he sees, because he sees the, the end from the beginning. And he saw that if he did not intervene, man will annihilate himself. So therefore, God steps in and creates a destruction to save man. And so when we go to and I'm not going to flip on over, but over in, in uh, Genesis 9, dealing with the rainbow, I, I really recommend getting, getting hold of Rabbi Hirsch and, and uh, the Ramban and others and study the, the issue of the rainbow because there's so much there about it uh, that's, that's interesting. But in a nutshell, what the sages teach, Hashem says when he looks upon the, upon the rainbow, he said he would not bring the, you know, the destructive waters upon the earth to kill all of man, like, like happened before. It's more or less going to be localized, like you know, what happened with, with Sodom was lo localized. What was happening, what was going to happen with Nineveh was going to be a localized situation, but not, not including all man. But this is what, last night I laid awake just pondering this, this issue, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna, this is my own words. It's as if when, when Hashem looks upon the rainbow, it reminds him that humanity is due strict just judgment. He's just. It's due. But Hashem the merciful one like leans over into the ear of the judge and, and, and talks to him a little bit about backing off the mercy because he says, when I see the, the, the sign, I'm not going to do, you know, I'm not going to destroy the earth. He applies some mercy. And then on the other hand of it, when you talk, read what the sages say about the rainbow, we're on this side, this side of the rainbow. We're looking and we see it. Oh, it's so beautiful. I mean, we all, I just hear a couple of weeks ago, we take pictures and this and that. But technically for us, it should, it's, the, the rainbow is a warning that we are worthy of the strictest judgment that we have violated the six commandments. Just like the flood. Because see what I'm saying is, when we look at Hamas wrongdoing, the generation of the flood vanished except for, for Noah and his family. And when God talks about the rainbow, he says, I'm not going to bring the flood waters like he did at that time on that generation. That means that the earth, that, that, that something there has, that when that rainbow appears, that the sins of the flood is going on right there. And we need to look at that and go, we're worthy to receive what, or we're due to receive what we should get in strict judgment. But God says, no. He gives us the opportunity to do teshuva. The rainbow is, a, is, is like he gives us breathing room 
to, to, to make right that which is wrong. But technically, Hashem put a, a, a sign for him and for us that strict judgment is due and that strict judgment is based solely on the Sheva Mitzvot. The six laws of Adam, the seventh one the given to Noah. There are seven uh, rabbis have some really good teachings on the seven colors of the rainbow in, re in relation to the seven commandments. And so when we look up and we see those seven colors, it's not, you know, unicorns and tulips. It's, it's serious business. And we've, we've gotten away from looking at, at these Sheva Mitzvahs. We've got away from looking at this life that we call a Noahide life as being serious business. Because this is serious before the king. Amen. And, and I say, I'm saying that to myself too. I have to remind myself almost all the time that, you know, certain things going on at work, it's easy for me to, I'm having to grow myself in ways because I'm having to learn to judge how I'm even being treated by someone else according to the seven laws. Because if I react the way I want to, I'm going to violate, you know, you know, you want, uh, you're being squeezed like a diamond. <laughs> yeah. And so, yeah, being tested, like Scotty says. But uh, that's, this is what really has is, is, is got me about this issue of the flood in, in Nineveh. I will bring up Nineveh, what's really interesting. In, in chapter 3, verse 8, the second part of uh, the verse says, uh, Everyone, the message that was to come to them, everyone is to turn back from his evil way and from the robbery which is in his hands. The word robbery here in the Hebrew is Hamas. This ties it back to the, the sages have said the sins of Nineveh was the sins of the flood. And it's right here because the word Hamas, the same word that's used that the earth was full of Hamas, now it says Hamas is in their hands. And um, let's see here. Oh, I meant to highlight this. I've got to find it real quick. Um, let's see here. Is it more? Let's see. Yeah. This is his. Marie Carr explains that the phrase of. of uh, denoting open crimes of which the victim is aware while Roddick explains that it is their Hamas robbery that is equal to all of their other crimes, which was, they had sealed them to doom. Um, in general, the phrase is taking figuratively to denote injustices of which they were guilty. The robbery in their hands, the Hamas that's in their hands, meant that they knew what they had done. As a matter of fact, it says, up. I think first part of A, where is it at? Uh, oh, no. It says in verse 9, he who knows, let him repent. And it says, this generally refers to, uh, oh, it says, whoever's cognizant of his sin, he has committed. This brings me back. It says, he who's cognizant of his sin, let him repent. Let's go back to what, what Rabbi Hirsch says, that our conscience is to, is to caution us before God. If not, Hamas, there's no protection from it. And so he who knows, let him repent. That means that you, you're, you're allowing your, your conscience to direct you in what you know what is right and right, what is wrong. And it's cautioning you. And if it doesn't caution you, then you're not, you have no protection from Hamas. It, it will take you over. According to what Rabbi uh, uh, Hirsch is teaching. So anyhow, I brought to all of that. <laughs> I just wanted to, I guess I wanted to stir your, your interest in looking at your life in, in relation to the flood and to Nineveh. 
Uh, and what, what, go ahead. No, I'm sorry. I, I think Dan was going to say something a oh, second ago, and I'm then sorry, I, I, didn't, I didn't say it. Dan, do you still have something you wanted to add to? And then oh, no. You know, I, I, I got verbal diarrhea sometimes. You know, it just goes on and on and on some days. I, I don't know what to say. But. I understand exactly what you're talking about, Dan. <laughs> I, re I resemble that remark. I uh -huh. <laughs> well, all I can say is, you know, back at, uh, when he was talking about the, at the flood, you know, uh, when Hashem said, the end of all flesh has come before me. For me, that was just a profound statement that jumped off the page with the complete and utter sovereignty of Hashem. You know, I, I looked at it in a sense, I was reading Ram Kal, I think when that notion dawned on me about the sovereignty of Hashem and looking at it from a, just imagining if, if Hashem knows all about all over all time, all at once, he does. And, and, and okay, the end of all flesh has come before me. In other words, it's due and it's happening. And uh, I knew it always was going to happen and it's here now. Uh, and then the mercy, if it wasn't for the mercy. But I love how Terry brought out uh, this side of the rainbow. And um, uh, yeah, it's not all unicorns and fairy dust for sure. Yeah. Uh, Terry, can I, can I take you back just a little bit to something? Yeah, and, go ahead. Uh, I'm going to. I'm going to catch you off guard. Are you ready? You never catch me off guard. You okay. Just, you're just steering the ship. In the, in the seventh and eighth verse of the same chapter of Genesis that you started us in, okay. and I, I got a question for you about the eighth verse. So in, in Genesis, oh, now, I did I'll, put my, well, hold on, I did. There, I've got there. it in, in the Hirsch. Um, uh, well, you, you said the eighth, the eighth uh, verse? Uh, the seventh and the eighth verse. Um, can now in the Hirsch on the eighth verse, but I want you to read it out of uh, that that book you've got there. But on the eighth verse, it says, "But Noah found favor in the eyes of God." Now, would you read the seventh and eighth verse? And what well, you have, and I got a question about it. Still in my rambon, so it's it's got a lot of. See, there's the ninth verse, and we need. The seventh and eighth verse, actually. Seven and eight. Oh, wait a minute here. There's 10. May need to go get. Uh, I can feel you're getting closer. Well, this, for some reason, this. I have a question on that, too, if you this, don't mind. This Rambon just uh, goes back. Three, six. Okay, seven. It says, And Hashem said, I will blot out man whom I've created from the face of the earth, from, uh, from man to animal, to creeping things, to birds, sky, for him. But Noah's found a uh, greater favor in the eyes of um, Hashem. Now, in, in the, the um, uh, hearse, it says, But Noah found favor in the eyes of 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 God of Hashem. Right. I, my question is, and Veronica, do you want to ask your question first, uh, honey? Before I ask mine. Well, I don't know. Maybe yours is the same as mine, but well, let, there's, let's see. There's, there's two ways of of um, of saying that, and and if you could maybe expound on it, um, Terry. But it says that um, Noah found favor in God's eyes, but it doesn't. Really, it doesn't say God favored Noah. Well, so that, that was my question, Veronica. My question is that, is that Hashem looking down on Noah and seeing he was righteous? Or is that um, uh, Noah was finding grace in Hashem? Which, which direction? Is, is that what you're asking, Veronica? Which direction is that going? Is that from Hashem yeah, to there's, Noah there's, or Noah? Well, I don't know about direction. I just know that there, there's two ways of looking at it. I mean, there's two ways that, that it can happen. But yeah, I guess, yeah, I guess it would be, you know, him looking up versus Hashem looking down or something. My mind, my mind is telling me, and, and uh, I don't want to answer my own question, but my mind is telling me that in all the corruption that was upon the earth, that Hashem saw grace in Noah. 
and and so therefore uh just just like you know he saw that he needed to destroy in order to bring salvation um that he pulled noah out and 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 his family so go ahead terry i'm what what have, um hold on dan might even want to jump in on this one too um Hold on, I'm going to my inner lineal because there's something I know I've stay. Actually, there is a I've I've got a book on Noah, the teachings or teaching about Noah from the Midrash Rabbah, which is um very interesting about his name. There's a ton of of teaching just on the name of Noah that uh, and what it means. Um it, it's more than I can say right here. I didn't, I, I got it now. I thought I would cover some of it, but I said, no, that was going to be just piling too much on the pile. Um, hold on. I'm trying to find this right here in my, um, oh, I went back too far. Let's see here. Let's see here. Let's see. Okay. Parshish Noah. Um, wait a minute. That's a nine. I need to actually go back to the verse before Parsha Snowak. Um, I, I didn't mean to catch you off guard, Terry, but it does no, no. This good. is what I want to what I want to bring out. Um, this was the, this is interesting in the name of of Noah when we look at the Hebrew. Noah is noon het. Okay, Noah is noon het. The word that's translated favor or grace is het noon. The exact same letters, but in reverse. So what does that tell us, Terry? Well, there's some really, like I said, some very interesting midrash on the, just the name of Noah and what it what it represents, what it means. It's, um, it gets in talking about how p the parents, they, they give us, they're, they're guided with Hashem on giving us the names we have because it means who we are. And Noah means rest. And what does grace mean? What does it bring? It brings rest. And so there's there's some very deep midrashic teachings on these two words in this passage. But when we read the Parshas Noah, we'll read in there two or maybe three times. I know of at least twice that Noah did all that Hashem had commanded him. That was his righteousness. That was his grace. That was his favor. Again, what I was trying to say earlier, Noah was adorned in six mitzvahs, seven after the flood. That was his clothing. Don't get me wrong, but that's permissible things don't fit us right. Yes, yeah, we can do it, but it's not our assignment. When I read what <laughs> her said, this is an assignment. This is a law and a decree. I'm just going to tell you. I want to say, I'm not finished studying this out. It all comes from Genesis chapter 1, verse 11 and 12. When God told the earth to bring forth the trees, the vegetation, the fruit trees, and the, and after their kind. And I talked to my, my, my Jewish friend who's, who's of the tribe of Levi about this word that is there. Rabbi Hirsch goes on and says that the whole Torah in English basically is the law of same kind. Grass doesn't worry about being a cedar, and a cedar doesn't worry about being a, an oak. They are designed and assigned a mission on earth, and they do it. They don't question their assignment. 
and he brings up the issue between Israel and the non-Jews. Each has an assignment that we learn our assignment from Genesis 1, 11 and 12. Wow. He, and it's called the law of the same kind. That's Mary, why, that's that's, that is why... That is why in Israel, in, in, in Israeli law, Israeli Torah law, that we're not, that they are not, we're permitted, but technically we need to learn from this, this, this mitzvah, to graft and the crossbreed. Everything that is bred, crossbred, is sterile. Everything that is, is doing its assignment is fertile. It produces fruit with seeds and from this alone we can get the laws of forbidden sexual relations we can get the laws of that we get all the seven laws from we can get it from verse 11 of chapter one when you sit down and you ponder out the law of same kind and israel is of its kind the nations is of its kind, and every nation has a kind. They're not all alike. And I love, I was listening to Rabbi Singer today when I was at lunch, and he's talking about this guy wanting to come and, and, and convert Jews, and he wants to convert um, African Americans, you know, people from Ethiopia, because they have all that in common. He says, he says, before God, color doesn't mean a thing. You know, but it's everybody has a they're a kind. Every nation is is of its own kind. There are seventy nations. There are seventy kinds of nations, and as we look as an example in Genesis one eleven, let the trees bring forth the vegetation for its fruits and its seeds, and the trees and its fruits and its seeds, and and they're and and from the day that that. Well, this word is never, the, the God's word is forever. It's being forever spoken. But from the first time when God spoke this, however many years ago it is, we know man was 5,781 years, but beyond that, God spoke this and has never stopped. Why are we trying to change something that's been forever in essence? I mean, it's been since the day God spoke it. Forever. Hashem's word is in heaven. Amen. And so I sit there and I'm thinking of this. Why should, this is why we don't need to look to Israel and want to, to act like the Jews. It's, it's not our kind. Yeah, learn. Learn from them. We learn. We do learn. We learn from the oak tree. It's stout. It's strong. It provo provides you know, food for animals and stuff. We can learn principles. Yeah. Consider the ant. Consider the ant, not become it. And and just I'm I'm loving Rabbi Hirsch and the book of Genesis. I mean Terry, can I just throw a comment this, up there? Just, I, this is my Torah that yeah. I meditate on day and night. <laughs> I'm just saying. So go ahead, Dan. Well, you know, a lot of us have come out of a Western religion, you know, and we've come away from it. Let's just call it what it is. And uh, you know, uh, I know a lot of people have heard in the past that uh, if you had the faith of a mustard seed, okay? And I remember arguing with, with people of that persuasion at one time, you know, and saying a mustard seed can only become a mustard plant. End of story. End of story. The whole point is don't burden people with the imagination. And um, they would twist this as though somehow you have to exercise a churn out and spit out some faith that's going to become from little to huge when they're missing the whole point. It can only become what it can become, okay? And I think that when it comes to lessons like uh, raising up a children in, in the way that they should go out of Tanakh, you know, so many people misunderstand that as though they can browbeat and discipline and correct in a way that is not common to that child. Whereas the rabbis truly teach the core of the matter being the child has this natural disposition, it has this natural bents and inclinations and aptitude for this and that and that and this. 
teach him in that way because when he's old he's not going to leave it it's it you know develop who he really is and the person will thrive as opposed to trying to be something you're not and i think you hit the nail right on the head with this last last point thank you well i have not finished studying in that situ this out myself but it's it does tie in it tie it, this ties in to to what we're we're learning here if if the generation of the flood would have just looked at the trees around them and studied them, there wouldn't have been a flood. The imagination runs wild. You know, and I don't know. I just so ex I'm I'm excited. I'm, okay, I'm just, like Scotty, I'm just going to say it. I'm sold out on Sheva Mitzvahs. <laughs> you know, a lot of people have a problem. Well, I can't see that in, oh boy, now I am seeing it everywhere because Hashem has opened my eyes through the, the help of the rabbis and the sages and the, the, I mean, his firstborn son has been my blessing. And, and, and that's Israel, right? That's Israel. Exodus chapter 4, verse 22. Make... Moses, go tell Pharaoh, Israel is my son, my firstborn. Yeah. And 100%. 100%. And this is why, this is why in, 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 in Zechariah 8, 23, we got to come to the Jew to know that God is with them. This is why, you know, we have to look to God and say that everything we were taught out here in the never, never land was, was without naught. It was without any reason. Is, Daniel, you got your hand raised. Okay. Uh, okay. I've rambled on enough. I just, I, oh, I, I love, I love Genesis. I love Genesis. I guess y'all got that. So anybody got anything that they would like to share? Can, can I give one more clarification before Dan takes off again? I, I'm thinking clarification. So Noah, was adorned in the midst vote that he was commanded, and therefore he was in the eye of Hashem. He was in the grace of, in the favor of Hashem. Okay. Because he was doing what he was told to do. He was, God gave him an assignment and he understood it and did it. And so we have an assignment. We have an assignment. And if we do them, if we do them and we learn them in their depth, you know, and, there, and when we, we say the depth is like what I said earlier, the, 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 the minor things, what we might see as minor things of life and how they apply, like a friend loaning a, a stolen CD. Don't take a part of something stolen. Don't let that come in your, if you go into a store and there's, there's a stack of free magazines, like there is, you know, the little trader magazines that are free and you pick them up. When I first accepted, I'm talking about the, I'm practically the week I accepted the seven mitzvot before Hashem of myself in 2016 i was in a, in a store and I, I picked up some of them free trader things and i got to the car and i noticed there was one that was in the mix that said 99 cents and i'm like how many people were like oh no way ain't gonna miss 99 cents no i walked right back in and i put it down because i'd just been learning i was still fresh learning the sheva missus and I come out that storm before I got out of the car. I said, thank you, Hashem, for showing me what is right according to your law. So if we do these, if you want to get the attention of Hashem, do what he's right. You will like, like I said, my, my friend from that's of the tribe of Levy, when he's, when he was standing, if you, you get to see my blog, Adon, I mean, um, adorned in mitzvah. And you'll see his picture at the top. He gave me permission to, to use it. And when you look at beautiful it is, and imagine that's you. You're not in a tallit. You're not holding lulav. You're, you're, you, you know, you don't put on tefillin. But that is you in your adornment. What you look like to Hashem. As beautiful as he is before Hashem, we have the same beauty when we take on the mitzvot and we do them in our heart for the sake of Hashem. We have the same radiance. 
Go ahead, Daniel. Hello. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, I just wanted to uh, clarify something in my mind that you mentioned earlier on about the um, issue of robbery becoming public, right? Uh, is it more related to the fact that it would start at something private, which is, you know, sexual immorality, and then it would become something public, which is robbery? Or is it more related to the fact that people uh, tend to start thinking about things that are no longer frowned upon, um, they would start thinking about them as something permissible, you know? Mm -hmm. When something becomes public, uh, it, it usually uh, happens because prior to that, something is no longer frowned upon, you know? So right. it becomes like sort of a snowball, you know? People start right. just doing it because they see it, other people doing it like publicly. <clears throat> right. Sorry, right. in a public we, way. We have... You know, in, in this age right now that we're in, this era, this, this time period, there is a group of people that sees no wrong in looting and destroying another man's business. They are publicly stealing. And there is a group that sees no wrong in that. Does that, does that make sense? Or does that help? I guess let me say that. Sadly, it does. Oh yeah, it's and not. It's not frowned upon. I mean, it's not. It's not accepted upon everyone, but there is a growing number that sees no wrong in that, and that's what happened in the flood. It started just like the wine, turning to vinegar. It was slow. It was just slow until the whole batch became vinegar. Sour, yeah. You know, Rabbi Goldberg shared on uh, last last Sunday during his Genesis class uh, out of chapter four, I believe it was. Uh, basically in the lineage of Cain and the names of the descendants, just getting into the names of the descendants. And he, he talked how he, they, you know, Cain was told to be a wanderer and a vagabond, that he'd be a wanderer and a vagabond. And then what you do, he builds a city, you know, and, and if you follow his descendants, this, if you want to talk about this wine turn into vinegar. I mean, you start looking at what went on just in the names, the Hebrew names and the definition of who these people were and what went on, understanding it in that light. We see this even today in our day and age. I mean, we live in a very, you know, a full globe. The globe's a lot smaller today than it was thousands of years ago in most people's eyes. I mean, we're connected by the internet. Everything seems to be, you know, less and less room uh, and encroaching, um, but we're faced with looking at ourselves before Hashem, you know, who are we before Hashem? Are we going to be who he has built us to be, bore us to be, or are we going to just be like animals serving our uh, evil inclination and not caring? And that just causes such a muck you know, I, I, I watch in, like, we had a debate up here in Canada amongst, in my province, amongst uh, politicians last night, the, the three candidates, and I've been watching some of the American, you know, when a party just disagrees with somebody else just because they're not on the same team, you know, all objectivity is lost on a point. It's just gone. You know, there's no, there, 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 you're, you, there's no integrity when it's just, you know, he's on that side and I'm on this side, so we're enemies. There's something so wrong with that, with, rather than realizing we are all made in the image of Hashem, and we all have a, a purpose for being here. And I think you touched on about tikkun olam, you know, what we can begin to do to make this world a better place. That's one thing Rabbi Goldberg always shared with me. Make the world a better place. And that's at the core of, uh, of walking in the Sheva Mitzvot. And I think everything you shared today just inspires. Well, thank you. Terry, there was a question come in before you close tonight. Yeah, any, you... yeah, any other questions or comments? Go ahead, Scotty. Uh, just if uh, they wanted to know, uh, and we you know we get this uh, question quite often when you start talking about the, uh, I'm going to call them commentaries for right now, that you used to find this information. If you could real quick show them again and so that people would have a, a video reference to look look those. Uh, and I think you have, don't you, on your blog or somewhere or on a Munitrek, have a list of great 
Um, and I think uh, Rabbi Pesach does too. Does uh, he's got a link to Immunitrek right on uh, uh, on on his website? I think he's got uh, uh, a link to my blog. My blog Immunitrek dot com. It's E M U N A and then Trek like in Star Trek dot um, com. I have a reference uh, list there of books that's from my personal library. Not all of them, but the ones I, re I rec <clears throat> recommend. And I've got some links there as well, some website links. But this is, is, is what Robbie, uh, I mean, Scotty asked. This is the Rabbi Hirsch commentary. It's a, it's a five book commentary about that big each. This is just only on Genesis. Okay. I read from the Ramban, Rabbi Moshe uh, Nachmanides. I have the whole Torah commentary by the, the, the Ramban. It's an art scroll publication. Oh, you can, Beautiful. You can see that. Now, his Genesis is two volumes. One that I absolutely love. If you don't mind me, I'm going to turn right here. I really recommend this one. For starting out. This is a two-volume set on Genesis through the Arch Girl Tanakh series. It's a really good beginner set. There's over 2,000. Beginner? <laughs> turn, turn the face of that around, Terry. Uh, Thomas right. said turn so the both, both face volumes, face. Both volumes looks like that right there. Voracious. That is uh, Ashkenaz for the very first word of the Torah in the beginning. And that's the uh, or now, Terry, Terry, uh, I heard uh, Michael Skoback, Rabbi uh, Michael Skoback, uh, today put a post out where he's got a link um, for um, a booklet that he's put out, a book he's put put out that is um, uh, a list of literature to look for, and it's just you know I'm looking forward to seeing that. I saw that link today at lunch, but I didn't get time to open it and look at it. Yeah, he's putting up a new website. Uh, Rabbi Skobak, Jews for Judaism, uh, and uh, he's on this Tanakh Talk show. Wonderful, wonderful rabbi uh, up here in Toronto, Canada. Um, but just beautiful, beautiful material. I'm sure that this is going to be chock full of a list of literature to look for. Right. And, um, you know, you got to realize a lot of this stuff is veins like gold. But you must understand, as B'nai Noah, what are, we, what are we permitted to study and what are we not? And why are we studying it? We need to always keep that in mind right? I, I highly recommend if you're interested in really knowing what is in the book of Genesis to, to find you an orthodox rabbi or an orthodox you know, person, doesn't have to be a rabbi, but someone who's educated, which most of them are, but who is willing to teach what it is because some people say, well, why are you reading these commentaries? Won't you read, you know, so-and-so's? And it's the Jewish people, the Torah-observant Jewish people of Israel has been studying this book, in, it, in or the Torah, five years. books, in, for over 3,400 years in its original language. Unchanged. Unchanged. So why... Would you learn how to overhaul a V8 from someone who only knows how to polish a floor? <laughs> my, my, my dad told me one time, <laughs> he said, uh, the way you're presenting, that's what I would tell. You know, I, I've talked to my family about this. And uh, he said, that'd be like me going to the dentist and the dentist pulled on one of my teeth. And I'd look at him and say, you know what? You've done a pretty good job of that. I'm supposed to have heart surgery next week. Would you uh, do my heart surgery for me? <laughs> right. Yeah. And, and a lot of people will. Never mind. I'm not going to tell that. <laughs> <laughs> but, but anyhow, the reason why, I mean, I wasn't raised studying by the sages of Israel, but once I started studying and I started learning and I started learning the language when, when I teach, I teach nothing but what the, the sages teach. I have no opinion. I have no interpretation on my own because I don't know it. You can't add to it, that's for sure. And I can't add to it because what can I add 
to something that's been studied for 3,400 years. And I just came on the earth in 1965. What have I got to add? <laughs> but ourselves. Okay, any, any other comments or questions? Did, did, Emuel, did you have your hand up? She was waving goodbye. Oh, she's waving goodbye. Yeah. Okay. At, at Dan, Daniel had to leave. Okay, Daniel had to leave. Okay. Uh, I want to throw one more thing in before we come to a close. You know, I did not, I just want to talk to the people that think this would be too hard. I, I, I so agree. You, you need to have a proper teacher. Proper teacher. Proper teacher. Um, but, uh, you know, I did not do, I, looking back now, I wished I would could go back and do school over again because I did not apply myself and I had to teach myself to study through all my ministry and uh, I had a couple of commentaries but I had to teach myself and but I had to re reimagine if I can use that word imagine and grasp I, I so understand this text now that said to grasp uh the hymn of, and I'm trying to say this, just trying to get it out and you can clarify, you, uh, uh, interpret my towns and terms here for me, Terry. I, I, and when I grasped the hymn of a Jew, something happened to me. Uh, when I, something happened, when the proper teacher, something happened to my mind, the way that I think. And now I see the falsehoods in what I used to think. And it was right back to that adorning, <clears throat> right back to uh, being it. Now, I do agree with Dan. There are certain things that uh, I, I do study, uh, not for so I can do them, but so I can apply them to my teaching um, in who I discuss uh, Torah with. But, um, I, yeah, I just had to rethink, and I, and I could not have, I cannot do it on my own. But if you think you can't do it, you grab the hymn of a Jew and you hold on a, a hymn of a Jewish man and a rabbi, a teacher, I guess I'm, I'm, I'm trying to drive his home and you see what happens to your mind and your way of thinking. It will even make you look at the wind and, and uh, at one of my oldest sons said, I used to kill a rat the minute I saw it. And now I'm trying to save it and get it outside. And so, I mean, you know, just, it just makes you look at everything differently. So, um, you, do I, do you need to clarify some of that, Terry? No, you you said it ex exactly perfect. Uh, you said it perfect. Let me put it that way. Can I put in a couple of cents here? Yes, of course. Um, they are my two pennies, by the way. Um, <laughs> no, they're Shem's two pennies. Anyways, I, I wanted to thank you, Terry, for um, for your for your class today. Um, I always come away looking at something different. Brighter. Whenever, whenever you teach. <laughs> so I, I really, really appreciate, um, you know, what, what you discussed today. And um, if I can, I, could, I would like to use at least one of them, one of the things that you mentioned with regards to the... Um, um, how Hashem made each thing to its own kind and that kind of stuff. Um, if I could borrow that for, for my Parsha class tomorrow, um, I would, you know, I think that would, would enlighten some people too. Uh, you'll just give me a second here. Uh, like I said, he actually, in the study I've done about the flood, about Hamas, he brings up this passage uh, because it's about corruption, uh, the corruption, sexual immorality. He actually ties corruption where it says the earth had come corrupt back to Genesis chapter 1, uh, 11 and 12. And I'll read this real quick. And God said, let the earth sprout. And this is uh, for your notes, Veronica, Genesis chapter 1, verses 11 and 12. And God said, let the earth sprout vegetation, seed scattering plants, fruit trees bearing fruit according to its species, 
which has its seed within it above the earth, and it was so. The earth brought forth vegetation, seed scattering plants, according to its species and its tree bearing fruit, seed bearing according to its species, and God saw that it was good. Rabbi Hirsch goes on and says, each of them is a work only for its own species. Each, each species is a work unto its own species. And to develop only within the circumscribed sphere assigned to its kind. That blew me open. You know, my, I'm a thinker. When I saw that, my, my brain just went. Okay, he says, let's see. Well, um, I know I highlighted the section where he brought out. See, he says, all pervading and all embracing this law. He says, all plant substances energizes, operates within a specific and fixed limits. The form of each plant crystallized into a specific and predetermined form. This great law, which is made manifest to us in the plant world, governs everything from the cedar to the hyssop. It rules in minute fibers and seedlings, even as a giant tree that reaches toward the skies, all pervading and all embracing this law according to each individual plant species to develop only within the limits set for it. This law echoes from the blade of grass as well from the tallest cedar proclaims, uh, let me find this word, uh, la, man, la me, la me, la, la me, la, la me, Nay, ha. I hope I, I probably destroyed it. I'm sorry to my teachers. But anyhow, that means, that word there means the law of the same kind, according to its species. He brings out, um, let's see. He says here, these, I'm just going to read what I've got highlights. See, clearly the Torah considers it crucial that we see divine lawgiver in the organic life of nature, for Torah directs our glance toward him at every step that we take in our lives. These mitzvot, this, these, yeah, these mitzvot warn us to keep this law also as regard to our own species. It's talking about man. To impose the law God has given us also upon our drives and energies and to realize it all that we do refrain uh, that we do or we refrain from doing he has set down for both man and you the law governing development of their lives only within let's see here yeah only within confine in the confines of the divine law can we attain individual freedom and independence? The whole Torah is nothing but the mitzvah of the same kind. What was given to man, uh, the, the, uh, given to the man of Israel? The divine law was given to all of the world's creatures. It expresses itself in all free, unfree creatures, controlling them automatically. Saying, see, the cedars and the plants don't have any control. They, they have no free will. The animals have no free will. So it says it expresses itself in all the unfree creatures, controlling them automatically. And it is proclaimed to man and Jew so that they should accept it upon their own free will to rule over their drives and energies through this subordinate, subordination to the divine law that they fulfill the exalted mission of their species. I'll read that again. Through this subordination to divine law, they fulfill the exalted mission of their species. 
God needs in the household of his world, the blades of grass as well as the cedar, the ear of corn as well as the grapes of the vine. He has given to each its own law within which each one of them is to live its own appointed life without questioning why it is a blade of grass and not a cedar, an ear of corn and not a vine. Each leaf leaves the planning of the world to God and is happy to make its own contribution to the whole. In this same manner, God also needs the kingdom of his world, both Jews and non-Jews. Jews and non-Jews each has been assigned his own mission and his own law. And God's sublime purpose will be attained only if each one, Jew and non-Jew, will fulfill the mission and obey the law that God has assigned to him. Through the performance of duty, he will make the contribution that is required of him for the common good. Wow. And I'm sorry, I'm going to say hallelujah. No, I'm not sorry for saying hallelujah. I just hallelujah. It's just, it's hallelujah. Praise God. Baruch Hashem, however you want to say it. We learn from the plants. They are, they are not free to choose, but we can look and take what, what the laws that God gave them to be, to raise themselves up in the spirit in which God had created them and become the best that they can be inside their own species. So can we as Jews and non-Jews. Wow. You know, Terry, you really got <laughs> I'm, I'm me thinking. Going, I'm going on. <laughs> I wasn't even going to teach on that tonight, but I did. <laughs> no, that was necessary. I think you covered a lot tonight. I really do. I really think, uh, you know, I've had plenty of debates with some rabbis or conversations, serious conversations and the questions of evolution. Um, and, um, you know, the, the standard uh, religious view is, you know, no species. God made a species after its kind, after its kind, after its kind. But I think you touched on, on things here that cover the gambit. My, my, my issue has always been that its kind is on a crescendo. And it grows and it changes. And if people have true understanding of what evolution is, it's a question of that natural curve. It's growing on its own after its own kind, okay? As opposed to, and I think you touched on some of the negatives tonight when you tamper with such. And there is a concept that I find most devilish in this world, and it has to do with willful evolution, that willful exaltation, that willful advancement. Um, in an unholy fashion, self-driven desire and nothing before Hashem could be more deviant in that respect. And um, I think when one understands Hashem knows all about all and is leading and guiding and taking things where it needs to go, be patient and know that he's going to get you where you, he, he knows he wants you to be. But I love the way the rabbis talk about freedom of the will choice you have the you know the you have this gift you have the ability and it's different than just selection is different that you know you can work towards what Hashem has called you to be you can make the decision to be who Hashem has called you to be and that is completely different than than willful evolution willful evolution wants something it wants it contrary and we see this with religions that want to usurp the promise of God to Hashem, our promise of Hashem to the Jewish people. You know, he called them, and that's clear in the Torah. That's clear in the Torah. He called them to be a kingdom of priests. And the reality, how that plays out, you know, for humanity to try to, to, to miss that or make it up some other way, you're actually you're putting yourself at odds against Hashem. And I, I can't help but just say, let them be who, who Hashem has called them to be. And if you just tune your ears, and like you mentioned, grab the hem, or Scotty mentioned, grab the hem of a garment, you will uh, be, be lit up in ways that you can grow for more than your lifetime and, you know, pass it on to your kind, pass it on to your children, pass it on. And, and, and I think 
the biggest thing with B'nai Noach that the, the rabbis are so concerned, do we have the, the ability to propagate in our communities, develop our communities, become who we're supposed to be in our communities and share the, the truth. And we're doing good stuff here online, and it's a joy to hear you share tonight. It's just a joy to hear you share, and I'd be joined by many other people. But, you know, we got to work this out in our communities to preserve our kind. You know, our kind. But, yeah. but, but you know what, I, I, my thoughts, Dan, is that before we go into our communities, we've got to do it among ourselves. We got to be, we got to develop. The real ourselves. deal. We have to develop ourselves within our own space. We have to come to the knowledge ourselves. Like, I feel like I can say this. I have come to the acknowledgement. I, I studied for seven years to be a Jew. But Hashem has shown me that is not who I am. And, and I am slowly, it's took me almost five years to grasp that I'm a non-Jew. And I love it. I'm glad I'm not Jewish. Because he, everything he has for a Jew, he has for me as well in my species. And I can, but we can still support them. I, no, we can. I'm not saying anything about that. I'm just saying that I was, happy I was, I was willing to do willful evolution. Yeah, yeah. And how many people do that religiously? You That's know that I'm religiosity. Saying. I know our friend Veronica. She's asked a lot of questions over the time I've known her. And and you know, people want to. We want to avoid ritual and and right uh, that 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 mindset that you must, you must, you must. The beauty of the Sheva Mitzvot. I think you shared on some beautiful stuff today there. I love. I, I want to thank you. It was wonderful. Yeah, we need to, to bring this to a close. Any other questions or comments before we close our, our class? Because Does anybody want to say a prayer for Pashek while we're here? Or you guys, you know, I just want to encourage you. you say a prayer for him tonight. Say, you, yes, you know. say, keep, him, keep him and Shira both. And Shira. In, in, in your prayers. They are, they're awesome uh, people. I, uh, I am blessed. That, that he made the phone call and contacted me years ago, about two years ago, it made a difference in my life. Amen. And so, well, so uh, Hashem willing, are we on for next Wednesday? As far as I know. Now, and Hashem willing, Pasha will be back. And if not, if, if not, you're going to have another message prepared. Might, and I think it's going to be, be awesome, as awesome as tonight was. Might be Scotty. I don't know. Ah. So, but that being said, uh, coming up in November, I know 11th um, and maybe the next, that's on a Wednesday and the next Wednesday after that, I may not be here. We're moving. So my computer is shutting down, being boxed up. And I don't know how long it's going to take. I had to do it for a few setup. weeks myself. <laughs> so, but anyhow, Scotty's going to be here to help out and, uh, you know, run things and be the engineer he is to help Pesach out. And and then eventually I'll, I'll come back on, back online. And then Scotty and I both can just tag team it together. And uh, as, as, what is it, her will, you know, he and I will grab Pesach's arms and hold him up. <laughs> well, folks, there's always lots going on uh, with the B'nai Noach. You can uh, find lots at Torah for the Nations uh, and B'nai Noach Connection with Israel Facebook pages. Uh, I know they'll be doing some more. I've got another broadcast tomorrow night with uh, Rabbi Pinhas Levin. You know, uh, I hear this week they've got they've got the the the, the bet din. Uh, you can find that on No High World Center uh, social media pages. Uh, they'll be doing a live bet din for those that want to. Uh, make that commitment before a bet din in Israel. A wonderful opportunity. Check it out. At least study to see what it's about before you take the leap. At least make the right steps. You know, uh, I'm still planning that uh, 27th Chesvan event for next month. You know, there's lots of things going on. It's always exciting to be with wonderful people that love Torah, that love Hashem, and to hear the Torah the way it was intended and passed through uh, the hands all the way back to Moses it's beautiful. And so, folks, we're going to sign out until next week and uh, uh, have a wonderful, wonderful week. Yes, thank you, Dan. And uh, thank you, everyone, for tuning in to Torah for the Nations. And uh, if you're interested in, in being part of us, join, send us a, a, a request to join B'nai Noach Connection with Israel. We have our Zoom links there, and our Zoom links are also on 
uh, Rabbi Pesach Sherbo's personal page as well. Good night, everyone.